Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mark's Community Church. My name is Pete Stearns. I'm one of our pastors here. And uh, there is some energy in the room today. And, and I'm not totally sure if that is a reflection of just a season of growth for us as a church or uh, a reflection of the sorry state of uh, Carolina Panthers football right now. Uh, but either way, we're so glad that you chose to join us today uh, for worship, a chance to gather together uh, with our community as we continue to lean into this series we're in, Bless Your Heart. Uh, when we talk about Bless Your Heart, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek play on an acronym uh, from Dave and John Ferguson's book, uh, Bless Your Neighbor. You see, this acronym is meant to give us tangible ways to live out and embody the greatest commandment of God to love God and to love others. And, and we have chosen strategically to place it right here in the midst of a season that is particularly divisive in our nation. In a time, in particular, a week in which it feels tumultuous. But in doing so, we want to be known as a church that practically leans into Jesus' call, regardless of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, to make connections rather than to create divides, to bless our neighbor, to love them, and to pour out God's love upon them. And so we started in our first week with that B, begin in prayer. It's a little bit of a, a, a cheater in the acronym, right? Because prayer do, obviously doesn't work for that acronym. So they always begin, begin in prayer. And we talked about how if we want to be loving our neighbor, if we practically want to be loving our enemy, we need to pray for those, as scripture tells us, that persecute us. We need to pray for those that we seek to love. We need to be praying for our neighbors. We need to be praying for our church. We need to be praying for our families. We need to be praying for these developments that we see cropping up all over our county and across this region because when we pray for others, God gives us opportunities to listen to them. God invites us into spaces to listen. I've been stunned this week. Just, just occasionally, I've gotten into this practice of sending a text to somebody that says, hey, God put you on my heart today. How can I be praying for you? And almost every single time I send a simple text like that, there's an outpouring of a response from that person. It's, it's perhaps it's gratitude, it's, it's thankfulness that somebody there is praying for them. Perhaps it's somebody feeling seen. Maybe it's been an outlet for somebody that's really hurting, but that hurt has been pushed down beneath the surface. So often, just a simple prayer, a simple prompt to someone else opens up opportunities to listen to them. And today, we're going to continue that series with perhaps my favorite letter in the acronym, the E, which stands for EAT TOGETHER, okay? Now, it's no secret, I personally love eating, right? I've talked about it all the time up here. I love going to, to, to restaurants and, and, and trying out new cuisines and, 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 and interesting foods. Uh, I, I've shared over and over that my family and I have, have gone to every single ice cream shop in Alamance County, and, and, and we've got our own personal rankings of which ones are our favorites. Of, of course, I love the comfort of a home-cooked meal that brings warmth uh, to my spirit, uh, but I've also found that I like some kind of interesting food combinations. Like I have a little bit of a unique palate, and I'm not talking about it in any sort of sophisticated manner here, okay? So, so I, but, but I just love these comfort foods that don't make sense to a lot of people. In fact, oftentimes I'm surprised when I share my favorite snacks and people scratch their heads because I just think to myself, how could you not like that? Uh, for example, I was telling uh, Chris Yingle earlier this week to, to his shock and horror, I said, I said, my absolute favorite snack that I have every single night, and my wife Brittany can vouch for me in this, but every single night I have a large glass of milk and a bowl of peanut butter pretzels. Okay, I don't know what it is, but every single night of my entire life, I eat that before I go to bed. Okay, that is, I'm not going to advise that from a health perspective. That's not going to be how you drop calories and, and the whole nine yards there. But for whatever reason, that just brings me comfort. There's this creaminess of the milk and the, this crunchy saltiness of the pretzels. And I just thought everybody did this. Because I've been doing this since I was a little kid. And, 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 and so when Chris kind of was shocked by it, I, I thought to myself, oh, maybe Brittany was on something when she said I was a little bit weird, you know? It was, I, I was starting to get it. But it's not just that. 
I've shared before that one of my very favorite meals is, is this ham and bean soup. It's this slow-cooked meal over, over 48 hours, and it creates all of these complex flavor profiles in the bowl. And then just before it's served, you know what I do? I take a jar of sweet pickles, and I chop them up, and I put them right on the top, and I pour some of the juice in. Okay, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's strange. Again, there's this creaminess. There's this sour and this, this saltiness. It's just this odd thing. Uh, I can't have a bowl of ice cream without a glass of ice water, okay? I've got to have ice water with my ice cream. It's this palate cleanser. Every bite of ice cream, I have some ice water. But, but I'm assuming, I'm hoping at least, that I'm not the only person that likes these weird or unique food combinations. And so we're in the middle of a series where we're challenging each other to, to step outside of our comfort zone, to love our neighbor, to connect with our neighbor. So we're going to have a, a, a little bit of a small church moment here, and we're going to connect with our neighbors. Uh, and, I, and we're going to turn to somebody that we don't know, or maybe we know them, but, but the, and they're not a part of our family. They haven't come with us. And we want you to share, I want you to share one interesting interesting food combo that either you enjoy or somebody else in your family enjoys. And if you can't think of one, then you can just make fun of me uh, for about a minute here, okay? So we're going to do, we're going to turn to our neighbor. If you are online, uh, drop that interesting food combo into the chat. Uh, everyone, let's take 60 seconds to turn to a neighbor, greet your neighbor, and share that interesting food combo. All righty, let's, let's bring it back together here. <clears throat> Man, I think we were, we were on to something there because I haven't heard that much excitement in our worship center since I've been here. That was awesome. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna ask you to actually say it, but who's gonna rat on their neighbor and say that they have, uh, their, their neighbor shared with them a food combo that was as odd as pretzels and peanut butter? Anybody, or pretzels and milk there. Okay, we got a couple of you. We got a couple of you, so I still am, you know, on the strange continuum, I'm up here. But, uh, but yeah, we, we, we all enjoy these kind of interesting combinations of food. We pair these things together that don't seem like they would fit, and yet they do, and yet they produce this comfort for us. Well, well Jesus is, is no different. Okay, and, and we see throughout Jesus's life, throughout his ministry, and throughout his teaching, he pairs something very interesting with food. You see, oftentimes, throughout Scripture, we see Jesus pair the gospel with eating. And it doesn't seem to make sense. In fact, as we read just the book of Luke alone, we see ten separate stories of Jesus teaching and sharing the gospel message around a dinner table. You see, meals were essential to the early church. Meals were essential to the ministry of Jesus, so much so that he regularly combined our need for physical nourishment with our need for spiritual nourishment. You, you might think that, that Jesus' most effective teachings would, would happen in the temple. And, and sure enough, Jesus does teach in the temple regularly, and yet, over and over and over again, we see stories highlighted that happen around a meal. Meals that are extraordinary, like the feeding of the 5,000. Meals like, like the wedding feast of, of Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. But also simple meals, like meals with Zacchaeus, with tax collectors and sinners. Meals with his disciples. And over and over again, we see something remarkable happen when Jesus gathers together with others to share a meal. 
And so as we think about what it means to bless our neighbor, we recognize the importance of prayer. We recognize the need to put ourselves in a posture of listening to be able to receive the feedback from those prayers that we are offering, but we also recognize the need to eat together. You see, what's interesting is is when you really think about it, this combination of, of food and the gospel, of eating together and transformation, aren't all that odd after all. Because I have found in my life, and I imagine you have found in your lives, that the dinner table becomes a canvas for listening. It opens up space to hear one another, to share with one another. It invites a posture of of humility and surrender. As, as we release our grip on our, on our time, on our things, on our control to offer food to somebody else or to receive a gift of food from a neighbor, it cultivates a space where we can practice the very things that we are set about and intended to practice. If we want to listen, one of the best places to listen to our neighbor comes around the dinner table. It comes around a a small table in a coffee shop. It comes when we break bread together, when we share with one another. And so we're going to be looking at how that meal can become a canvas of listening because we're going to be looking back at, at, at three particular meals that Jesus shares in the Gospels, or in the Gospel of Luke, I should say. And we're going to be looking specifically at who Jesus is choosing to eat with and what we can learn from the folks that have gathered around his dinner table with him. So we're going to start by by reading perhaps uh, the most common or the most remembered uh, meal that Jesus shares. It's a meal that he shares with his disciples immediately before he is going to go to the cross. It's a meal that we still practice today regularly in our services, a meal that we, we sacramentally remember with communion. It's a gathering called the Last Supper. And so we're going to turn to Luke 22, and we're going to read 14 and 15. And what I want us to consider is Jesus' heart why he has chosen to gather for this meal. It's this really simple passage that we skip over to get to the good stuff. But, but I think when we read it, it, it suddenly changes our understanding of, of our gathering together. It brings this intimacy to what Jesus is doing. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I love this passage because it demonstrates Jesus' heart. He's not just sitting around this table because he wants to teach his disciples a lesson, though he will. He's not sitting around this table because he needs physical nourishment before what awaits him. He's sitting around this table because of his love for those that he's gathered with. He has this deep and intimate desire to be with his friends, to be with his disciples, to be with the ones that have walked with him through the highs and lows of his ministry. Jesus doesn't see food as a necessary evil that that, that slows us down. Instead, he sees that meal as an opportunity to be drawn closer together in relationship. And he eagerly desires to share that meal with his disciples. But what I find so powerful is what he says his intention is. He wants to share that meal with his disciples. He eagerly desires it. Why? So that he can go and suffer. He recognizes this meal with his disciples as the very thing that will equip him and give him strength and courage to go out and endure the cross. Let that sink in. 
Jesus, God in flesh, sees a meal with his friends as the very thing that provides the strength he needs to face the suffering of his crucifixion. To face the grave and ultimately the resurrection. There's something beautifully powerful there that I think we need to be reminded of as we talk about what it means to eat with one another. Jesus eats with those that he is eager to eat with. We are invited to eat with those that we are eager to eat with. Why? Because in doing so, we have strength. We live in, in, in a remarkably divided and, and, and challenging season in our world. And we are called as Christians to engage in, in, in some, some staggering challenges. A radical call to surrender our life, to enter into humility, to love others unconditionally. But if we're going to do that, we can't neglect eating with one another. Because it will give us the strength to lean into the radical calls and invitations of the gospel message. When I was a a family pastor, I stumbled across some research that was done by uh, Columbia University. (coughs) They surveyed uh, a a thousand students, or they had a thousand students respond to the survey. Uh, They surveyed uh, nearly 100,000 people. They had a thousand responses of, uh, of, of high school students, and they asked them how many meals they shared weekly with their families, okay? And and so the students responded anywhere from from zero to seven meals as a family. And and the survey then broke them up into two focus groups, okay? There was one group that had three or less meals with their families, and there was one that had more than four meals with their families. They divided them in these two separate groups, and then they categorized their responses on the basis of how many meals they were having together with their families. This group that had more meals with their family and this group that had less meals with their family. And the results that they found were shocking. The first may seem a little bit self-evident. The first was they recognized that students, teenagers, that reported having more meals with their families also reported a significantly higher uh, level of love in their relationship with their parents. Students that had more meals with their parents said that their relationship with their parents was stronger, that they had deeper respect for their parents. This this simple practice of gathering around a table cultivated an environment that deepened and strengthened their relationship with their parents. I suspect because they felt heard. They felt known. I suspect it's also because they were able to hear and know their parents as well. In the midst of the busy and chaotic schedules of the world, they paused intentionally and sat together every night as a family. And that meeting around the table strengthened them. It built their relationship. It gave them space to listen to one another and in turn love one another. But you see, the next responses were were somewhat surprising. They also found that students who ate regular meals with their parents reported having significantly less stress and anxiety than the students that didn't have as many meals with their parents. There was something about the challenges of the world that became more manageable for the families that were eating together than they felt for the families that neglected sitting around the table with one another. They reported a a one and a half times less likelihood to experiment with drugs and alcohol and tobacco. Students that gathered around the table with their families were less likely to participate in, in, in partying lifestyles that led them down all sorts of different paths. They also reported having significantly higher academic success and and higher GPAs. And I share this for two reasons. First of all, as, as a father myself, it's an important reminder 
of how essential my meal together with my family is. I, I think it's a challenge. It's so easy for the meal to be the thing that gets thrown away in the busyness of our schedule to move past it, to eat on the fly, to give my kids chicken nuggets in their car seats in the back of the car and to clean them out some months later. But the reality is, is that one of the best things that I can do for my kids is create intentionality around the table. Is to make that a sacred space in our weekly rhythm. And every conversation isn't going to be a powerful one. But the consistency of those conversations opens the space over time to listen, to hear, and to love. But the second the reason I want to bring this up is the reality that if meals have that kind of impact on our earthly families, what kind of impact can they have on our heavenly families? It is essential as believers to gather together around the table because it strengthens our relationship with one another. It opens our heart to listen and to hear the diversity of pain and joy in the church. It gives us the capacity to go out and engage with the world around us. It gives us the strength to be lights in our neighborhood, to fight back against the darkness through humility and surrender. And so our first challenge today is that if we seek to share meals with our neighbors, we must first be sharing meals together with our church, with other believers, with our family and our friends. But the intention of those meals isn't isolated to that table. Instead, it opens our minds and our capacity to engage with others. Because that's what Jesus did as well. Very few of the meals that we see highlighted in Scripture are with people that Jesus is eager to eat with. In fact, most of the meals that Jesus shares in the gospel message are meals with, with folks that, that at least you and I might not be very eager to eat with. In fact, Luke chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 27 through 32, uh, lays out a really powerful and beautiful story that, that we've taught about before. But I want to look at it again. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. Levi and Matthew are the same, by the way. Uh, sitting at his tax booth. Jesus is now calling his disciples, and he's calling these disciples that, that, that would be surprising to the culture around him. He says, follow me. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, we've talked about this before, but there's nothing special about the tax collectors throughout Jesus' gospel message. It's not that he has this soft spot for, for accountants or, or, or anything like that. Instead, Jesus is doing something very intentional by inviting Levi and Matthew, a tax collector, to follow him. He's doing something very intentional by joining a meal with tax collectors and sinners, because tax collectors at that time and in that context were seen as the very pinnacle of sinners. Tax collectors were seen as the worst of the worst of the worst within the Hebrew culture. And it makes sense because tax collectors had betrayed their family, their friends, and their community to align with the oppressive Roman government for one purpose and one purpose alone. Greed. You see, when tax collectors aligned with the Roman Empire, they were expected to place unfair taxes upon their family, upon their friends, upon their community, upon their synagogue, those that gathered at the temple with them. 
And it was through these unfair taxes that they were able to fill their pockets with wealth. Tax collectors had chosen finances over family, and they had done it in a remarkably public way. In fact, in rabbinical teaching, oftentimes tax collectors were said in the same breath as murderers. And so when Jesus eats with a tax collector, when Jesus invites a tax collector to follow him, he does something that is shocking to the world around him. He demonstrates that his gospel message is for everyone. He demonstrates that he is a savior for the worst of the worst of the worst. That those who culture does not believe are deserving to be redeemed, Jesus loves and is willing to align with, is willing to sit at their tables, is willing to gather with them. What Jesus does here is remarkably powerful. He intentionally eats and shares a meal with those that the world around him considers to be sinners. But what I find so interesting is how he responds to those Pharisees. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And at first it seems pretty straightforward. Jesus is saying, I have a specific heart for the sinners. That's why I'm eating with them and not you. You Pharisees who are devout and righteous. And yet, if we have read any of the rest of the gospel, we realize that Jesus recognized the Pharisees as, as sinful and fallen too. And so I think what Jesus is doing here is speaking to their intention, their receptivity. I was a runner in, in college, uh, but while I ran in college, my, my true love is soccer. Right? And, and, and so my coach had this rule that anyone that was running on the team wasn't allowed to play any pickup games of any kind of sport. We couldn't play basketball. We couldn't play soccer. Uh, we couldn't do anything with our friends. We definitely weren't allowed to be on the intramural teams or the club teams and, and, and the whole nine yards. And I remember this always produced a tension in me, right? Because I loved playing soccer. I just wasn't very good at it. And, and, and so my running track kept me from the very thing that I loved. And so you can imagine the conflict I experienced when the floor of guys that I lived with uh, put together an intramural soccer team and invited me to play with them. And I thought to myself, well, the games are really late and my coach goes to bed pretty early. And so what harm would it do if I played? I, I, I committed. I said, I will play, but I'm just not going to play very hard. Right? I assumed as long as I don't play very hard, I'm not going to pick up an injury. I'm not going to get hurt. And, and, and so that was my commitment mentally. But turns out when I got to the field, I had a really hard time following through on that commitment. And so wouldn't you know, on the first game, I had a collision with somebody on the other team. And, and I definitely broke my toe. Like 100%. The, the second toe, the middle toe on my foot, I broke it pretty badly. It was, it was pretty excruciating pain. And so I was sitting there after the game thinking to myself, what am I going to do? Right? Because if I get help for this broken toe, then I'm going to be outed as breaking the rules of the track team. And I can't face the scorn that I'll receive from my coach. And, and I was a college kid, and, and, and I thought of myself as pretty tough, and so I came to another solution. I thought, what can a doctor do for my toe that I can't do personally, right? And so that night in my dorm room, I kind of straightened it out a little bit, and, and, and then I wrapped it really tightly with tape, because I had seen that. You know, I'd watched Grey's Anatomy. I know how it goes, right? I had figured it out. And so I wrapped it up tight, and I showed up at practice the next day, and it was pretty painful, let me admit. It was, it was pretty excruciating pain, but, but the physical pain paled in comparison to the pain I uh, that I anticipated kind of emotionally with admitting to my coach and my team that I had directly disobeyed the rules and, 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 and now had you know, kind of limited our success as a team. So I just taped it up, and I ran on it. And it was painful, but, but I figured out how to compensate for that injury. And, and, and so I ran just a little bit differently, Right? I, I, I never told my coach, he might be finding out right now for the first time if he's, he's tuning in here, I never told my coach that I broke my toe, but what happened when I ran on that broken toe and I compensated for it? I picked up all sorts of other injuries. 
right? Because my body wasn't used to running at that level in that way. And so basically my sophomore season of track was just thrown out the door. Why? Because I was too stubborn to admit that I was injured. I was too stubborn to admit that I was hurt. If I had just addressed it in the preseason for track, I probably would have been fine. But because I ignored it, because I tried to compensate, I pulled my hamstring, I, I, I strained my calf, I did all of these different things that kept me from competing that year. And you see, I think that's what Jesus is saying here. When he turns to the Pharisees, who he clearly perceives as falling short of the glory of God, and says, I have come to be a doctor to the sick and not the healthy. I've come to respond to the needs of those that are receptive, those that are willing. What do we see when Levi is called by Jesus that he immediately follows him, that his immediate response is to gather his whole community, all of his friends, all of his people together to celebrate with one another. The tax collectors and the sinners are eager to be in the presence of Jesus. And so our challenge this week is that we eat together with those who we are eager to eat with, but we also eat with those who are eager to be with us. We have been given a remarkable blessing by being participants in the community of God, having the fellowship of other believers that stand beside us. It is a gift in a season of, uh, of, of mental health crises in our nation that very few are privy to. And yet so many are eager and longing for. And we have to ask ourselves the question, am I willing to share that grace? Am I willing to share that hope? I'll admit to you that if I take all of the meals that I've had in the last few weeks, a vast majority of them are with people that I am eager to eat with. A vast majority of them are with friends and family, and very few, if any, are with those that are eager to eat with me. Those that are desperate for that fellowship and the community. Those that wouldn't have that family if not for an invitation to sit around the table of somebody from this church or another. And I think that's a challenge for us as we think about engaging and blessing and loving our neighbor. Sometimes I think our ability to bless our neighbor just boils down to our willingness to be inconvenienced. Our willingness to sacrifice our comfort our willingness to sacrifice our safety, a willingness to sacrifice our friendship so that others might share in that grace, that others might share in that hope. And you see, I think many of us go about our lives never inviting somebody else over to our home that longs for that connection because we've made up a million excuses why this week isn't the week. We're too busy this week. I don't have a spare night to spend with a neighbor who isn't my friend. Well, guess what? We're never going to have that spare night. There's never going to be the convenient night to reach out to somebody that desperately needs community. We convince ourselves that our house is too messy. I can't have a neighbor over because what if they saw my playroom and they realized that I had children? Right? <laughs> There's this reality that they probably experienced that too, and that might bring them a whole lot of comfort to realize we don't have it all together either. We think to ourselves, it's been a long week. I'm exhausted and I'm worn out. I, I, I don't want to have awkward small talk. I don't want to engage with, with somebody that doesn't know me well. I don't want to engage with somebody who I feel like I have to keep my, my guard up. Well, guess what? If we make those excuses we're always going to find it difficult to listen to our neighbor, to bless our neighbor, to love our neighbor because we are denying them the space where listening and relationship happens. Those meals together, though they might be awkward, though they might create insecurities about the cleanliness of our home or the ability that we have to cook, are relational glue 
that draws us together with people that others might not expect to sit at our table. When we engage in a meal with our neighbor, we are actively surrendering our comfort, our convenience to them. You see, there's a final meal I want to highlight. It's a gathering of people that, that oftentimes we don't associate with Jesus' company. Jesus shares meals regularly with this, this group of people that seem to have it out against him. And yet it's a group of people that Jesus eats with more regularly than any other group recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And yet it's a group of people I've never heard a message preached on. Would you believe me if I said that Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, shared three meals around the table and in the homes of Pharisees? In Luke 7, verse 36, Jesus is going to share about this one of these meals. And what I love about this is that in chapter 6, immediately before this, what does Jesus command his disciples? To love their enemies and to pray for those who persecute them. And right here, a mere moments later, he's going to practically embody that challenge he's just offered them. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I think we skip past what's happening here. We skip past these stories because they don't make sense. It doesn't jive with, with our understanding of, uh, of Jesus' words of challenge to the Pharisees. And yet, Jesus seems to prioritize. Jesus seems to be willing to eat with the very people that he should hate. The very people that he should consider enemies. The very people that will quite literally send him to his death. The Pharisees despise Jesus. In their meals with Jesus, they seek to trip him up, to cause him to stumble, to condemn Jesus, and yet Jesus still enters into their presence. And this is powerful because in, in our culture, if somebody invites you over to eat, you just, you just do it, right? It would be rude if you didn't. But in this ancient culture, it was pretty regular to deny someone's invitation to share a meal with them because to share a meal in the home of another would to be to give them an ultimate stamp of your approval, an affirmation of their lifestyle. And so the fact that Jesus is eating with the Pharisees should be uncomfortable and shocking to us. It should be a challenge to us to eat with those regularly who we are not eager to be with. We should be called as a church to gather with those in our community that we might perceive as our enemy, that we might perceive as our persecutors. Why? Because it invites us into a posture of humility. It invites us for a moment to put down our swords, to surrender our power to another, to share with them and eat with them, and be with them. I'm not going to beat around the bush here. This last week has produced a myriad of emotions in our country and in our neighborhoods. There are millions of people who are joyfully celebrating the outcomes of this last election. And yet, in the same vein, there are literally millions of others who are fearfully mourning. And the culture that we live in tells us that we should either gloat in our victory or fight back in our defeat. We are invited either into selfish anger or selfish righteousness. Self-righteousness. And yet in that space, I wonder if Jesus invites us to eat. 
if Jesus invites us to share a meal with someone who culture tells us is our enemy. Why? Because they're also our neighbor. I wonder what it would look like if this week, as we thought about who we were going to be praying for in our neighbors, in our neighborhood, if we thought about who we wanted to listen to humbly in our neighborhood, as if we thought about who we wanted to share a meal with in our neighborhood, if we started with the folks whose yard signs look different than ours. And I get most of us don't have yard signs, but, but you know what I'm saying. What if we intentionally, as a church, sought to, to bridge divides, sought to break down barriers in this country, sought to enter into a posture of humility and share a meal to open up a space of listening and not speaking with those that think and live differently than we do. And I get it. For some, this feels remarkably uncomfortable. In fact, maybe it's, it's creating this, this anger that's bubbling up in us right now, and yet for others, it feels trivial. And yet, it's what Jesus did with the groups of people that quite literally, through political means, sent him to his death on a cross. What would it look like if we ate with those that the world tells us are our enemies? You see, meals are powerful. Meals have impact. Meals can transform, but that transformation has nothing to do with you and I. That transformation has nothing to do with the food that we serve. Instead, that transformation has everything to do with the host of the meal. The transformation that happens when we gather around the table points directly to the host of the banquet. And guess what? You and I are not the hosts. Instead, when we gather for meals, we all gather around the Lord's table. Love, as we jump back to that first story that we shared. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus, before the meal, is going to teach his disciples about the power of eating together. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is so beautiful. When Jesus was breaking bread with his disciples, when Jesus said that this bread is like my body that's going to be sacrificed on the cross, that this, blood, this cup is like my blood that is poured out in a covenant of protection and redemption and restoration to you, he wasn't talking about sacraments that would be served in miniature little cups in pews like these. He was talking about gatherings that happened around tables in their community every single day. Jesus was saying every single time you eat together, you are practicing the remembrance of my mercy and grace. You are drawn into the reminder that you have fallen short of the glory of God, that you are in desperate need of a Savior. The power of a meal is that when we share a meal together, we are not the host. Instead, we are co-guests at the Lord's table. And I think that is so important to remember, especially when we talk about inviting our neighbors over to our house, inviting those that are eager to be with us and inviting those over that we are not eager to be with. We're not Jesus in these stories. No, we're Pharisees. We're sinners and we're tax collectors and we're inviting other sinners, other tax collectors and other Pharisees to join us not at our table, but at the Lord's table. And we're trusting that when we sit together at the banquet table of our Savior, that redemption and restoration happen because we are reminded of the mercy and grace 
found on the cross and won for us in the victory over death in the resurrection three days later. When we gather together with those that think differently, that act differently, that engage with the world differently than we do, we are practicing that remembrance that is rooted in our humble surrender and our admission that we desperately need a Savior. And we are trusting that that Savior has the power to redeem the Pharisee and the tax collector all in one swoop. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we admit to you that it is so easy to ignore your invitation to eat together, to assume that, that eating food is all about physical nourishment. Lord, that we can just eat on the road, that we can skip the meal here and there, but every time we do, Lord, we miss out on an opportunity an opportunity to practice the remembrance of your sacrifice for us on the cross. And so, Lord, this week, as we seek to bless our neighbor, as we seek to love our neighbor, Lord, I pray that we would gather around tables together, tables in our homes, tables in their homes, tables in restaurants and coffee shops, picnic tables in the park, so that, Lord, we can be joined together as co-guests of your great banquet. And Lord, in humility, we can listen and receive your mercy and grace. 